Thank you for tuning in to TalkWad.com, the world's fastest growing internet radio network. Please check out all the other great shows on www.talkwad.com. Listening to ComedySlamRadio.com. From our studios to the world, we bring you the finest in quality entertainment. So pop some popcorn, grab a smooch buddy, and settle in for another fine show from ComedySlamRadio.com. It's time for the Let's Be Frank Show, where we get frank with your favorite celebrity and national touring comedians. Follow us on Twitter at Let's Be Frank Show, and if you miss our live broadcast on Comedy Slam Radio, find us on Stitcher Radio, Podomatic, and iTunes at Let's Be Frank's Podcast. Keep laughing, my friends. <coughs> Good evening, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to the Let's Be Frank show. We got Gwiggy here to my left. How you doing, Gwiggy? I am good. How's it going, brother? Not too bad. You got that little excited girly smile because we got somebody on with Second City. I always do. I always have a girly <laughs> smile on whatever. <laughs> you, you just like me, you big pansy I do, bastard. Yeah. I think That's you're why gay. I come here. So. I want to. I want to introduce everybody to Jimmy Della Valley or Jimmy D. How you doing, Jimmy? Hey, how you doing, Frank? How you doing, Gwiggy? Nice to meet you. I'm good, thanks. <laughs> thanks to meet you, too. <laughs> so I want to thank you for taking a few minutes out. I know we tried to do a show a few weeks back, and you had we all had some scheduling issues, so I guess yeah. that's what's happening when you're out in you know L.A. and you're moving and shaking as opposed to out here in Clearwater where we're sitting on the beach and waiting for people to call us. <laughs> yeah, but, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, so you've been pretty yeah. busy now. You've been shooting movies. I mean, comedy's taking you far, far in the entertainment industry. Yeah, it definitely. Um, <clears throat> stand-up comedy helps. It, it definitely gets you in the door. But if you can't act, you're not going to book. You know, you're not going to book acting jobs. They're just going to go, oh, he's just a comedian. He can't act. But when you can act, you know, like you got your Kevin James, your Ray Romanos, uh, Joe Rogans, you know, they can all act. So that's why, you know, they had such longevity, you know, in, in the, the comedy world of of crossing over. Right. So, and then also, um, you know, having an improv background uh, is just, it's so huge. I mean, uh, like I went in uh, for an audition the other day and the uh, casting directors are like, look, and, and I received an email from my, my manager. It's like only the top uh, improv people in Los Angeles are going to this audition and there was only like 20 of us, 20 of us. And it was like me, Rick Overton. Um, I forgot the other guys, but Rick Overton, you know, legend, yeah, legendary absolutely. comedian, one of, uh, one of my mentors, really good friend of mine as well. And, uh, when I crossed over into the acting world, he was like, man, he goes, you're a really good actor. So he doesn't even ever introduce me as a comedian anymore. And that's kind of like, wow, that's amazing to me. Once he saw my acting, he goes, like the other day, uh, I was uh, filming something. I saw him, and he was walking by, and I was like, uh, and they had said cut. And I was like, and I go, Rick, Overton? He's like, yeah. And he keeps walking. I go, it's Jimmy D. And he turns around. And he's like, oh, my God. Da, da, da. And then this one guy, he was running in to do a podcast. It was so funny. Rick was running in to do this podcast, and he's introducing me to the podcast guy. And he goes, oh, my God, this is Jimmy D. He goes, this guy's a uh, fantastic actor. He goes, he used to be a comedian. He goes, but now he's just such a good actor. He goes, I don't even know if he'll do comedy anymore, even though I still do yeah. comedy. You know? Yeah, I So mean, it was like, it's nice. Hard. You know, he's, a, he's a legend in my eyes. He's been doing comedy since 77. Yeah. 77. It's a long. guy's been around, dude. That's a long damn time. Yeah. Yeah. We actually tried to get him. Uh, a friend of mine tried to sent him a letter, uh, I guess via email or Facebook, uh, asking him if he wanted to come on to the show. I just never heard back from him. Uh, oh, no, I'll, I'll get you on. It's a non-issue. Anything, oh, anything I tell him, refer him, he'll do. Nice. Awesome. Well, so anybody you else that you have under your, anybody else you have under your mind control, just send them on <laughs> over to the Let's Be Frank show. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I don't mind uh, 
trying to get famous off of the back of Jimmy D. Uh, <laughs> I, you know what? I think uh, a few weeks ago you had Veronica Mosey, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you had mentioned me or whatever to her, but she had opened for me. Oh, and when I was knew that? that? And I knew that she had, and she was very new. But I, I told her, I said, I said, I think you're going to do well in this business. And sure enough, she she did, and I think she's did Letterman or something now. Yeah, she's she's done a lot. She's had a pretty darn successful career. Uh, I think she was on. It was either last week or two weeks ago, and uh, we had uh, Chris Shaw had called in, which is nice because one of the things I do is, I mean, I have such a, I guess, a wealth of different comedians that have called in, and everybody, you know, nobody gets paid. They volunteer their time because they know a lot of other comedians listen. So uh-huh. when Chris Shaw, you know reached out to me and said, Dave, I got a new CD dropping. Can I call into the show and promote it? So I'm like, of course you can. So it was kind of cool because I, I don't normally have two comedians that are up on that level on the phone at the same time. So it was nice. <clears throat> no, right. no, I don't even think anybody heard me talking last week. <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. Great interview. <laughs> Great interview. If Dave's not talking, everything's <laughs> going perfect. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, no, Chris Shaw, I remember I met him uh... – in uh in michigan he was opening for me he was just starting he was just starting out we were doing casinos he was like yeah man i really want a headline i got a million kids i think he had like (laughs) five or six kids and he was driving from like indiana to florida i mean he was going everywhere just for one night just to make money and sell his little pot shirts or whatever they were back then (laughs) that is great he's definitely got the long dreads and stuff to go with pot shirts we we didn't bring that topic up josh blue liked to talk about pot though that was fun (laughs) so oh yeah i never i never met josh but i know who he is yeah yeah uh so tell us a little bit about with, you know, when you started in comedy, where you started at? Because you're over a decade in comedy, so what city yeah. did you start at and what made you decide to get on the stage the very first time? Well, I'm 41. I started stand-up in 19 in uh, in uh, Syracuse, New York. And uh, there was a club called Wise Guys. It's very famous. Uh, Dennis Miller, Kevin James, uh, Ray Ramon, everybody went through that club. It was like one of the one of the best clubs in upstate New York to go through, and um, I went there and uh, I tried to get the, tried to get in at seventeen, and my um, the, the, they were like, oh look, you can't go on stage, and it wasn't like a, you know how they do like an amateur night now. They had like a headliner, and the headliner was actually Ralph Harris. I'll never forget wow. it. it. Was Ralph Harris was the headliner, and they let about six or eight open micers go up. And uh, that was my first time going on stage that night. And what happened was, at 17, two years before that, the uh, the owner was like, "Look, Jimmy can't go on stage. He's not 21. He can't be in a club." Da, da, da. And then uh, my father ended up saying, uh, "You know, so I the guy's like, go home and write for the next four years and come back." I'm like, "Oh, what the hell? You know, can I swear?" Or, yeah, do whatever you want, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, what the fuck? Are you kidding me, right? <laughs> and then so so then what happened was my father ended up going like this. He's like, so I'm telling my dad the jokes every day, and we're doing this, and then I'm just doing stuff. And I was working at uh, BJ's Wholesale Club at the time, and I did the Christmas party. And I actually forgot about that until until the other day that I had did that Christmas party. That actually was my first gig ever, and it was like $25. And I wasn't <laughs> nice. a comic. I just was maybe funny. And I brought notes, and I did like 30 minutes, and I did the Christmas party. But a guy on Facebook found me like, hey, we went to school. Oh, my God, you remember you did this thing? But so what <laughs> happened was at Wise Guys, at 17, they wouldn't let me on stage. He said, wait until I – and by 19, my dad's like, fuck this. I'm done with listening to your jokes. And he took me to the club that night, and he forced the guy to put me on stage. He goes, you're going to put him on right now, or we're going to fight. And now, first off, <laughs> the guy was a fourth-degree black belt that owned the club. Oh, damn. 
And the guy's like, look, sir. And he's like, he's like, you're going to put my kid on the stage tonight. So that's what happened. And I ended up getting on the stage that night. The guy could have killed my dad. But it didn't matter. You know, he's an old Italian crazy man. He doesn't want to hear his kids' jokes anymore. And they put me no on. And I, and, I did pretty, and I did pretty good. And within three months, I was a pro. I was working as a pro. The headliners, to this day, I always – very easy to work with people. I always take care of the openers, the features, when when they work with me because I, th- th- those headliners took me under their wing. And there was a guy named Dee Dee Michaels who uh, was at the club, and he would come. He he would headline the club a lot, but he'd also come and he'd mess around and come and practice new material and stuff. He was local, and and he goes, "Hey, I got a limo." He goes, "We get a whole bunch of pussy." He goes, "You can drive the limo, bang all these broads." And go on the road with me, and and he goes, I'll give you five hundred to a thousand a show. Like that was, nice. and I, I was like, Dri-, yeah. So and that's after driving, three months, and, and uh, just started driving the limo, and then we do shows every single night. And but then I started gambling really heavy, <laughs> and then that that was a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like three or four months into it, and you're already and you're up there doing that. I mean, that's incredible to be able to. Yeah, yeah. So- I was a pro, I was a pro instantly, and uh, but I was still going back and uh, on the Sunday night I was still doing that uh, open mic uh, amateur, but it wasn't like an open mic with like music. It was all comedians and then a headliner, so that I was meeting them all, and then the guy would be like, "Hey man, why don't you come on the road with me?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm already on the road with Dee Dee." Like, "Oh, Dee Dee, oh Dee Dee's great." So that's how Jimmy D kind of came because I was like the little. Little version of Dee Dee. Nice. So how long did and you stay on the do comedy anymore? Yeah. How long did you stay on the road with him? Um, for for a couple of years. You know, we were just going all over the place, and he was so funny and so likable, and uh, very you know very charming with the ladies, and uh, he was a fat guy, but he was handsome, and uh, and that's what I what that's what I ended up being now a fat guy that's handsome. That, that's like why I both. have you on the oh, show because I'm fat and handsome. Wiggy thinks yeah, he's well, fat and handsome. Mildly that, attractive. That, that was my tour for the last couple <laughs> of years. Was tall, tall, fat, and handsome. Tall, fat, and <laughs> nice. handsome. Yeah. Nice. Now, what was what was the first thing you learned about being on the road? Was was there any tricks to to being able to handle it? I mean, you were you're basically 19, just out on your own as a as a young adult now. Uh, how often, um, like yeah. was driving tra- limos, was and, that a hard transition? I mean, it, and banging fun, broads. It sounds already because yeah. just banging women all the time, <laughs> banging broads, driving, driving limos, limos so. gambling. Yeah, yeah. It's, it sounds like it was rough. Yeah, I know. Well, you know, having that limo was amazing because it would like he would like go, he would literally like be like, hey, I'm gonna hook up with the this girl and I drive the girl in the limo to the thing and I'd be on the street just chilling, you know, in the limo. And back then I think we had a cell phone, but I think it was like really expensive to use it. Were cell phones around 20 years ago? Yeah. Yeah. The the big ones, you know, the big Zach Morris ones. Yeah. Yeah. I remember they were really (laughs) expensive, like $3 a minute or something like that. I was like, Oh, so, um, every once in a while I'd use, it was his cell phone. So I'd use it every once in a while, I think. But, um, Literally, a girl walked down the street, and I was really like I was skinny, and and, and handsome. Like I, I was like a Bud Bundy. Like I started modeling and stuff back then as well. So I looked like Bud Bundy, and that was like the thing. So girls loved it, and I talked about that on stage as well. And I had the like nice, you know, I still have a nice full head of hair, but I'd have it, and I I literally looked like Grandmaster B, Bud Bundy. It was, <laughs> awesome. and I would and I would joke sometimes. The girls like, oh my, are you him? And I'm like, I'm like, yeah. If you want to suck my dick, I'm him. Like you know. <laughs> And there were so many, probably 20, 30 times, girl, uh, Dee Dee would come back to the limo, and I'd have a girl. And he's like, how the fuck do you get a girl? They, he was literally just walked down the street, and I'm like, yeah, yep, exactly, <laughs> exactly what happens, buddy. I got 19 years old, I got a limo. <laughs> he's like, you kidding me? And I didn't have a limo license. <laughs> That's awesome. So it was fun. And I'm sure you had a nice stocked bar in there for you. Yeah, we had everything. We had everything. So you, you had a gambling addiction. Was that the only addiction? Did uh, you know back then? 
I you, think you he mean, was addicted to pussy? I mean, come on. Well, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. It was only it was only addicted. Uh, it was only pussy. All right. Um, I was never. I mean, you know, I fucked around and drank forties and stuff. Hung on the corner, you know, with the boys. Hung on the stoop. But uh, I was never like the guy who just like drank and drank and you know what I mean every yeah. night, like Ron Wyatt or something like that. Yeah, that guy. Does he ever go on stage without a drink? No. Well, he's got to have remember, a drink you know, and a cigar. He's a, he's a class. He's a class act. I actually have a great story about when I uh, when I was opening for him. He's a great guy. But but um, yeah. No, I just I saw the addictions. that Didi was doing coke and drinking and uh, you know and and then I was seeing guys like thank God I never caught anything sexually transmitted. But <laughs> we were we were dirty, man. I mean. I I didn't even know what a condom was. You know what I mean? Like it was like, you know, like when you watch porn and you know you get the fake ones like the male hunter or, or mm-hmm. that one they do in Czechoslovakia or whatever. You know, and the girl's like, you is you okay? You not dirty? No dirty? <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm not dirty. The guy pulls his dick out. He's got like 15 warts on it. You're like, oh. you know, I wash the warts. I wash the warts. <clears throat> the warts are clean. Yeah. Nice. So, what was the uh, what was the breaking point when you went from uh, acting? I'm sorry, from comedian to acting. What was the first acting gig that you did? Was it a commercial, a little uh, TV skit? Well, actually, as I think back, it's actually uh, I'm actually this is weird that I'm telling you all these stories because I haven't told these stories. But I've had these in the back of my mind, so it's like nice that we're actually getting this private little interview right now about the back in the day, back in the day. Because uh, there was a famous comedian named Rich Ramirez who just died. He was a a very good friend of mine. Um, he just died. He was from the Bronx. He was an awesome, awesome comedian. He was a Latino comedian, and uh, he was just fantastic. And uh, he did tons of TV, and he did Law and Order. And back then, I didn't even really know what Law and Order was. Mm-hmm. And he came to the club like he was one of those guys that came on a Sunday when I'd be working out material, and then I'd go on the road with. Stuff. And uh, he did an acting class, and he was like, it was like Sunday, it was like from two to four, and we did a couple acting scenes. And he's like, hey man, he goes, because I don't know what you're doing. He goes, but you could be like a phenomenal actor and he didn't say that to anybody in the class and i was like oh, i mean that dude i barely can read like you know what I mean? like, and uh i never thought about it until when uh, rich died uh i think it was about a year ago a year or two ago and uh it was crazy because it was like fuck and i look back at all my notes I actually i have all like all my notes and classes that i've taken over the years and uh and then i saw him um about six, seven years ago, and I was in New York City, and I was, and, but I was living in L.A., but I had went back and I was doing some shows. He's like, hey, man, he goes, are you acting? He goes, I remember when I met you with a young kid, I told you, you'd make, I go, yeah, man, I've just been on The Sopranos. He's like, oh, my God. He's like, I knew it. I knew you were going to, you know, and it was, like, pretty cool for that guy to have known, and I literally only took a two-hour class with him. Mm-hmm. So then I never... Never did anything. That was like in freaking 91 or 92. And I didn't start acting until um, 90, 99 was my first time. And um, that was in New York City. And um, what happened was I was uh, dealing craps in Mohegan Sun. Have you ever heard of Mohegan Sun or Foxwoods? I yeah, have. Too bad. Absolutely. Yeah. I've driven out there from Middletown, New York, where I grew up, to lose money multiple weekends. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I used to deal craps out there, and um, really, really good craps dealer. And what happened was um, I was sitting box that day in a suit, and I told you I was a handsome dude. So, <laughs> I'm, you know, they, they always say I clean up nice. So I'm sitting there, and this guy from William Morris is like, Breaking my balls, I'm like, yeah, yeah, just shoot the fucking dice. And he's going, he goes, he goes, he goes, dude, you make me laugh. He goes, I've been playing for six hours. He's like, he goes, I went and hit the ATM three times just to keep listening to you. Like, I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever, dude. Come on, we gotta suck my dick too. Come on, let's go. Right, you know, I'm breaking his balls. And I'm like, sir, I'm gonna pass the dice. He's like, da, da, da. so I go, on, so I go to go on break. And he goes, hey man, he goes, my name is, his name is 
Neil Stern or something like Neil Stern, you know, and he gave gave me his card. And he goes, hey, man, he goes, are you an actor? I go, no, I'm a comedian, man. I go, but I perform in Boston a lot because now I'm up here in Connecticut. And he goes, he goes, oh, man. He goes, dude, you're an actor. He goes, you just, you're a fucking actor. And he goes, I'm with William Morris, the biggest agency in the business. And then it took me a while to actually go there. It took almost two years for me to take a chance. And I went to William Morris. And they were like, oh, he's no longer here. And I'm like, ah, fuck. I'm like, all right. I'm like, well, whatever. I guess I missed the thing. And then um, I throw down my headshot. And I go, well, I don't know. Give this to somebody. Maybe something will happen. And the girl goes, wow. She goes, this is one of the best headshots I've ever seen in my life. Wow. And you can actually Google it. You, Jimmy Delavalle, it's a black and white in my leather. And uh, that was it. And they got me over to Paris. They, they're like, look, we can't represent you. But she called an agent over because I had nothing. And then Paradigm mm-hmm. represented me in, the, like, almost the first audition I uh, I almost booked. And the second audition, I made, like, 50 grand. That's and awesome. that was it. And I've been an actor since. <laughs> Look at Stud yeah. Muffin here in his leather jacket. Oh, you see it, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I see, I've actually, I've seen a lot of your pictures, but when you brought it up, Wiggy pulled it up on his <laughs> Motorola Zoom real quick. Yeah, that, that shot is just ridiculous. And they had me up for the lead in Fast and the Furious 2, and I couldn't Damn. fucking act. <laughs> like, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't look, you know what I mean? Because, like, now I go out for auditions with 9 to 12 <clears throat> pages of stuff. Like, no. back then, I'd go for, like, a few lines. But then when it was Fast and Furious 2, uh, the part went to Cole Hauser. Mm-hmm. But I auditioned, I got, like, three callbacks. I, I almost got the part. Yeah. But I really couldn't act. But they just, kept, they just kept saying, man, your look is just amazing. They wanted me on the pile of the Sopranos. But they wouldn't tell me enough, and I had a comedy gig. And they kept going... They're going, look, we can't tell you about it. And I go, well, look, Sopranos, I don't fucking sing. What are you talking about? <laughs> and they just, <laughs> I'm telling you, man. And it just, they kept telling me this thing. And I go, all right, well, look. I go, I don't know, man. I'm working bananas. I, shoot, I was working bananas in Poughkeepsie. I couldn't go to the meeting. I had already left. It was Friday. I was driving to the gig. And uh, they're like, look, we, we, they just want to meet you, the producers. And. And I said, well, what, what is this about? And they're like, look, it's a good show. And they couldn't even, like, what network? I wasn't even really an actor. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so then I ended up doing it five seasons later. And I feel like they punished me because they literally, <laughs> I auditioned 10 times for the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 10 times for the show. And I got a call back every single time and I didn't book it. And I was like, they're fucking with me. They're mad at me because I didn't, come meet with them for the pilot. So the ninth audition, was it the ninth? Oh, yeah, yeah, it was the ninth audition. Because I remember I was dating my my girlfriend, who's not my wife, and uh, George Ann Walken, who's Christopher Walken's wife. We were doing the audition, and she goes, oh, my God. And Meredith Tucker, who cast Boardwalk Empire, was the assistant. But now she's the head casting director for Boardwalk Empire. Yeah. And she goes, she goes, wow, Jimmy, that was great. She goes, call back tomorrow at Silver Cup Studios. I go, you know what? I'm not going to go to a call back. I just want to come back and see your pretty face next week for a different role. And they go, okay, no call back. And I go, really? They go, no, call back. We love you. <laughs> Boom. And I went in. <laughs> so now I tell my wife, she goes, what the fuck is wrong with you? Who does that in an audition? The biggest show I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I, go, I got sick, you know, I got, I was so comfortable always seeing them. And then sure enough, I go in and she's talking me up in that callback and I, and I don't book it. I'm like, what the fuck? So then I'm thinking, well, maybe I fucking, I screwed up. I talked shit to them joking. So the new season came, I think it was the fifth is when I did the new season came and they first episode breakdown came out didn't go in for an audition second third fourth and i went in for the yeah i think it was the fifth the fifth and the fourth episode whatever it was whatever it was it was one of those and i went in <clears throat> and uh i got the call back and i said you got you tell me here we go let's do this again so i go to the thing and now there's a million people in the room and david chase the creator is on the couch. 
Now, there's a ton of people. There's writers. When, when you go on for Sopranos, I've never seen so many people ever in my life in any audition from the Sopranos. I mean, there's writers, producers, every every possible person that's uh, affiliated with that show is in the room watching you. Like, they don't pull no punches. Mm-hmm. And he's on, and he's on a thing, and Georgia goes, all right, sweetie, you're going to read with me. And uh, she tells David, she goes, this is Jimmy Della Valley. He's great. You know, she, and he's like, yeah. He goes, all right, let's go. And I start reading with her, and I fucking decide to just read to him. <laughs> and everybody in the room was like, ooh. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I say, screw it. I take a chance. And, uh, and, uh, and then uh, she's reading some more, and I read with him. I read my lines to him instead of to her. Mm-hmm. And fucking... I, I mean, literally, I feel the whole room go like, holy shit, this kid, what the fucking crazy kid is. And then sure enough, um, I, I go to leave, and I hear him go, you see the balls on this kid? Like, I hear David Chase say it, <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I walk out, and an hour later, they called, and I booked it. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. So, you know what I mean? And, and the thing was, I had booked three episodes, and when I got there, it ended up, they ended up just throwing me a little few lines. They said, hey, they ended up going with a favor to somebody. You know, that happens all the time. Mm-hmm. They go, but they still want you on the show. So, you know, I go down in history as being the guy who's like, you like your fucking job, you pieces of shit. I don't know if you remember the episode. <laughs> I came in with the, all the, the Jew. It was the Jewish wedding. Okay. I mean, that, that's the episode. I'm the gunman. Cool. Comes nice. in. Now, it's funny because when you were telling the story, you talked about, in uh, Poughkeepsie, New York, Bananas, which is, I believe, the very first place I ever saw comedy at, because nice. it was about oh, a, Poughkeepsie, yeah, yeah, it was about a forty-minute ride from my house, and they used to do a show in Poughkeepsie, and sometimes they would do one in Middletown in the um, like the Holiday Inn. Exactly. So, so it, that was my experience with comedy clubs growing up. Was it was just they rented out <laughs> rooms inside of hotels. So oh, yeah. I haven't ever heard no no comedian in the over a year and a half of doing the show has ever mentioned bananas. So that was just awesome. I was just like, wait a minute, that's the first place I ever seen comedy. He's talking about, <laughs> nice. and I believe it's well, still there today. They still do their shows. It's still, yeah, it's, <clears throat> yeah, it's still there. And now they have another place in uh, Monroe, New York, or Washingtonville, which is uh, Jesters of New York. They do a show up there every Saturday night. So. We're starting to get a little comedy in our out of Manhattan. Nice. It's nice. Nice to see that come up there. Oh, yeah. Now, now can I ask you something about uh, acting? When you're doing callbacks like that and you're seeing some of the same people again, um, is is it tough to kind of give a lot more, show them something they haven't seen before when you're getting a callback to do uh, relatively the same show? and or, or what is it like in that sort of situation? Yeah, Obviously, one of the yourself- reasons that I book or get callbacks all the time was um, – I, I went through tons of acting classes. I ended up for six months at NYU right before I moved to L.A. And I was here for a good four or five years, maybe six years, because I've been here nine years. And my wife goes, why don't you go to class? I like, I don't fucking want to go to classes. I barely, I hated <laughs> high school. I, you know, I hate, you know, I hated school. And she's like, why don't you just see? Maybe L.A. is a different world. So... I had this guy, his name Eddie Jarvis, he had opened for me, and he goes, you got to check out my acting teacher. He's the best. I'm like, really? He's like, dude, I'm telling you, he's the best ever, blah, 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 blah. He goes, there's just something about him. He's crazy, and he was a big star. Do you remember the star to have only kid, Lewis Smith? No, I don't remember that. Well, he was uh, uh, that, and he was in Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. He had the platinum hair. He was perfect Tommy. Okay. Yeah, anyways, I mean, these are like cult movies. That I mean, they were huge. Like, he was a big star. He was banging Sharon Stone, and <laughs> the list goes on and on. Cheryl Ladd. And so, it, 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 really, he, he became a big star when he made the movie or after he banged Sharon Stone? Which is what, what yeah. propelled him? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't know. But there was, uh, what was, was, no, he was a big star. He was a big star. He was, like, really good-looking redneck. And uh, he had studied with all the greats. Lee Strasberg, he lived with Paul... Paul Newman, Sandy, Sandy Meisner, uh, Stella Adler. I mean, he studied well, and then he ended up with Roy London, who was one of the best acting teachers ever. So this guy, I went to the class, and the first day he goes, he goes, look, it's 240 a month. He goes, there's no doubt in my mind you can act. 
He goes, you just killed the scene. He goes, but he goes, but I'm gonna show you how to book. He goes, I'm gonna show you how to walk in that room and own that fucking room. I'm gonna show you. So the thing called creative hiding, but he just calls it he just calls it stealing scenes. <laughs> and creative hiding is when. Uh, so, Gwiggy, you're an actor. Uh, no, I mean I've done improv. I'm not really an actor. Anymore. Okay, so when you're sitting down in a, in the scene and the cameras are rolling or whatever, like I just did this with Vinnie Jones. I did a lot of uh, a lot of creative hiding. Like I'm when, when you're in a chair, you can hit 22 marks in a chair. Like you think you can go forward, backward, you know, there's so many things. You scratch your ear, you can play with your watch. Mm -hmm. It's all about making the camera, the DP, go to the director and go, you know, oh, my God, he's so interesting. We need to shoot more of him. So it's like you're constantly getting more footage, even if you're not the star. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, so when you, when you go, so when I go into these callbacks, they're blown away. Like, sometimes they'll bitch, they'll argue. I went in for Nick Cassavetti's movie. You know, he did Alpha Dog and, right. all, you know, all those fucking huge movies. And I went in, the casting director, I said, hey, um, I said, hey, can, can I move this chair? She's like, no, I want you to sit in the chair. I'm like, oh, okay. But, you know, you can take royalties, you can do whatever you want. That's your time. And I go, well, I'm not going to use, the, I go, I'm not going to use the chair. So I just, I fought with her. I didn't use a chair, and I ended up booking the movie. They never did it. I was supposed to play a uh, major role opposite Samuel Jackson. Harold Becker, the famous director, was directing that, and um, we didn't end up doing it. But I had booked the movie, and I literally fought with her in, in the audition. In, 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 in not like fought, but I'm like, please. I go, I, I just got to, I go, the scene doesn't call for the chair. I'm not using the chair. And she's like, She's like, all right, fine. You know what I mean? But it's like, I had to take it. And that's what Lewis says. He goes, go in that room. And he goes, you just own that room. He goes, you go in there. And the creative hiding is like, you know, so let's say I'm talking with you right now. Like, so it's us three. I mean, I'm most likely going to be the most interesting person in the scene because of, because of the tricks of the trade that Paul Newman taught Lewis and then Lewis taught me. Because, you know, I don't know if you know Paul Newman – was a fantastic friend, Absolutely. fantastic actor. But actually, before he died, me and Paul Newman got in a huge fight on Broadway wow. at a play with Patrick Stewart. And uh, I was yelling at Paul Newman, and he was yelling at me. It was crazy. It was a crazy, <laughs> crazy, crazy night. I bet. And it was in front of uh, my acting class. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm no pushover, and he got a little nasty with me. And I said, look, old man. I don't give a fuck what you've done. I'll knock you the fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and my whole acting class was like, oh, my. Oh, he's just saying, I'm Paul Newman. So then Joey Reynolds, I did the radio show that night with Joey Reynolds. He's a famous, you know Joey Reynolds? I know the name. Uh -huh. He's the guy who gave Howard Stern his start. That's right. Okay. I think. Joey Reynolds still has five hours a night. He just does talk radio. Mm -hmm. And I told the story in confidence to Joey, and he brings it up on the air. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Literally. Like, so I had to tell the whole story. I'm not going to tell you the whole story about the Paul Newman incident. But um, it was, it, the thing was, you know, he wasn't that nice of a guy, but he was a great actor. Mm -hmm. And there was over a thousand phone calls that came in talking about, oh, my God, I met him in an airport. What an ass. I, like, <laughs> so many people had stories about him for five hours long. Wow. And it was like, I couldn't believe it. Like, <laughs> but, I mean, the guy's, the guy's, you know, a legend. Mm -hmm. But I remember calling my dad and go, I don't ever want you to watch anything again, Paul Newman. I go, oh, he pissed me off. I'm so mad at him. <laughs> and my, da my dad's like, I love Cool Hand Luke and call him. I go, I don't care. So then... <laughs> There were a few months that went by, and my dad's like, okay, I haven't watched anything. I haven't. And then my dad calls me. I watched Color of Money today. I'm sorry. I <laughs> fucked <fuck> up. <laughs> it was great. Great movie, great. too. Yeah. I, my, the, first, I, the first thing I remember from, from uh, Paul Newman was actually Fort Apache, the Bronx. 
Oh I my God! One of the greatest <laughs> movies of all time. I mean, it's it was ridiculous, but that was the first thing I ever saw him in. Yeah, Fort Apache, the Bronx. Nice. I uh, my buddy, he opened. I was headlining Riddles in Chicago about four or five months ago, and uh, this kid named uh, Leonard Lucky Lucy. Luciano, like fucking Lucky Luciano. Uh-huh. He uh, grew up in the Fort Apache, the Boston. He was an extra in that movie. And he told me it was amazing, that movie. He Absolutely. said it was a great set, to be honest. So that's amazing you just said that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really was one of my favorites. I read along with Paul Newman's Black Bean Salsa. I dig that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm a fat guy. I got to give my props. I, he's, it's the only salsa I buy, and it's for a charitable organization. Nice. I'm so. telling you, when I was mad at Paul Newman, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy a dressing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You boycotted all fucking Paul Newman anything. Everything. <laughs> if I, if I could have deleted and blocked him on Facebook, I'm the king of deleting and blocking people. <laughs> That's awesome. You, you piss me off. Yeah, I wrote a bit about that the other day. I go, I go. If I delete and block you on Facebook, I've deleted and blocked you in person. So if you walk up to me, you're gonna get an error message. <laughs> <laughs> and that could be a black guy choked yeah. out you never know yeah cool. so what's the big master plan for you i mean you're doing comedy movies you just finished well, now you just finished up the big film and when's that coming out the one you just film finished should up. be out by fall latest uh, christmas I-, I would assume because i know the director just did two other movies and i know uh one of them it was a scary movie, and it came out real fast, like within four or five months. So I would assume this one will be out by fall. But um, the thing is, I'm going to do another, uh, I'm going to do a film in upstate New York called Path to Salvation, and uh, Rick Overton's supposed to be in that film. He right. was all excited when I contacted him. I'm like, yo, Rick, I think you should play this character. And I sent him a script, and he's like, oh, my God, I'd love to wor- I would love to work with you, Jimmy. So... So uh, where I'm, gonna play, I'm playing a priest, um, kind of like uh, De Niro from Sleepers. Nice. I play Father, Father Keith. Where in upstate so, New York uh, are you filming it? Um, we're going to film it, I guess, in Syracuse, Rochester, um, Buffalo, and um, almost up into, like, I think you can get to Ohio from there. Uh-huh. If you go. Yep. Yeah, part of it. Cool. So. so just before the show, we were talking a little bit, and... I guess you you just filmed a little something last night with one of the girls who's got the greatest ass in America. Uh, oh, oops, I'm yeah. sorry. Did I Chris, did I Chris, inter- Chris, Chris Brown? Oops, I meant I meant to say J Lo. J Lo, Jennifer Lopez is the producer on a show I just taped last night. Nice. Um, it's a new TV show called Stand Up and Deliver. And uh, it was uh, fantastic. We we did a great TV taping, three camera shoot, and uh, the producer already contacted me today and said, "Hey, we just wrapped on the first season." They go, "But uh, we're probably going to bring you back to do another set for the second season, a different set." So nice. That was you know really good. Yeah, I really just I got like six or seven applause breaks. It was it was fantastic. Cool. So yeah. this is a stand up comedy show then, basically. It's just- with, oh yeah, yeah. It's just all stand up. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, but it, it's it's called uh, it's on um, Nuvo TV, N U V O T V dot com. Mm-hmm. It used to be the old owner used to be C T V S I T V dot com, which I did many many years ago, and then they changed this one, so this one's going to be more Americanized type of thing or whatever. Cool. So, you've traveled all over the country. You've traveled in many countries doing comedy. It, where do you get? Where do you like to do comedy the best? Do you have a favorite city, a favorite club? Um, you know, New York City. You know, that's pretty. That was always my comedy home for years. I mean, in New York City, I would do a minimum of twenty shows a week, if not thirty shows a week, just in the city. It nice. was crazy. I would start from noon, doing shows for kids for camps. Then at 5, we do regular shows, and this is up until about 10.30 or midnight regular. And then we do proms. So I literally go from noon till about 4 in the morning every day doing shows. It was ridiculous how many shows we did in New York City. But out here, you're lucky if you can get 
two spots in a night because you got to drive, you mm-hmm. know, all around and. You know, and that's just keeping it polished. I mean, I already have a solid headlining act, but that's just keeping it polished. Yeah, right. So you go and you try a new bit. Like, I just wrote a new bit this week, and I tried it. I was a special guest at Lovett's Comedy Club this weekend, John Lovett's Comedy Club, and uh, I just, because I knew I was doing the TV taping, so I was like, let me try this new bit. And I wrote it last week, and I did it once, and it was like, good. So I perfected it. By the third time I perfected it, and I said, uh, I said, yeah, I said, Italians were the first, the Italians were the first magicians. I said, yeah, perfect example, Houdini. Guy was Italian. Did you know that? Look, I, I, I know you heard this. Yo, Vinay, make this body disappear. <laughs> no rabbits this time. No rabbits. <laughs> It's, so, anyways, I did that last night, and the joke destroyed. And I was like, Whew. you know, and that was a chance. Like, mm-hmm. you know, that joke wasn't tried and true, you know, in, in my mind yet. It was really only the third time I got to try it. Absolutely. Cool. But I took it, and I took a chance. I did it on a TV show, and my buddy was there, and he was like, oh, my God, dude. He goes, that was great. So, over the, over the 20-some-odd years that you're actually doing comedy now, how has your writing and preparing your new jokes changed? I mean, because you have your acting, you have all the improv that came throughout it. So from the first time you went on stage when you were haggling back and forth with your old man to where you're writing now, has, has it changed dramatically? Oh, my God, yeah. If I didn't go through the whole gambling life and all those fucking broads I was banging and living with, and I did all this crazy shit before I got married and then settled down. If I didn't do all that, I wouldn't be who I am now. Like if I would have just continued that, that crazy life and didn't settle down, my stuff would just be like, Hey, I banged this broad on the road. You know, like I used to, you know, the jokes I used to say is like, yeah, I banged so many girls on the broad or or, I I banged so many girls on the road that the pages on my map stick together. (laughs) You know, like I used to do jokes like that. And then it was like, now I'm married, so now I do bits about the fucking my wife and all the bullshit I go through with her and, you know, and all the good th- good things as well. But it, it completely changed. You know, I became, a, I became a man. I learned, you know what I mean? It was like I was just a little boy fucking running around getting tossed tons of money to do comedy. I mean, I opened for Gilbert Godfrey, and that, that – uh, Gilbert Godfrey, I mean, not a prick, but he took, you know, he took my videotape and he was with William Morris at the time and he never gave it back. And that was like this huge uh, theater I did with them. And I was so upset, you know, I never got that tape. They're like, oh, no, we don't have the tape. I'm like, he said he fucking gave it to you. Wow. You know, so I, and I've never seen him to that day, to this day live, you know. Absolutely. But I do a better impression of him than he does of himself. <laughs> he he didn't do too good on that uh, Rachel Ray and whatever uh, cooking show he was on. Uh, uh, Guy Big or Guy Big and Rachel Ray that had a cook off, and he goes on a cooking show and makes a peanut butter and jelly fucking sandwich. Nice. I'm like, yeah, what? Yeah. He doesn't. Uh, yeah, he's a little. I don't know. He really screwed up with that uh, Affleck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really. Now, now, um, um, now with doing all this act, all the different movies and TV spots, and sometimes commercials and stuff, and comedy, how do how do you balance the two of those out? That's that's got to be kind of tricky sometimes. Um, yeah, my wife gets so mad. Like last year, I I, I made a lot a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It was my biggest year ever, and she was like, plan a trip. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're going here. And then I call her. Oh, no. I, I'm like, oh, I just booked this. We can't do it. You know, and these are all acting gigs. I'm like, I booked this. Oh, I just booked this. She's like, she's like, what the fuck? She's like, this is right. I go, I go look, you, I go, you bitch when I'm not booking. And now you bitch when I am booking. Well, what can I do? And she's like, I know. But you know, so then I had just booked the Honda campaign at the, uh, I think it was October of mm-hmm. last year. So I booked the Honda campaign and we had to come back from Chicago and she went there with me to eat and I was headlining 
um, uh, at Riddle's Comedy Club, and I had to leave early, a day early. Mm-hmm. And they called me Thursday, and they go, oh, no, you're not till next Wednesday. They go, you're fine. And then Friday they call, and they go, oh, you, you have to, you're going to have to jump on a plane Sunday, mo- Sunday morning. And I go, are you sure? And then he checks. He goes, oh, no, you know what, no. He goes, I think it'll be good. Tuesday will be fine. And then right before I went on stage, Saturday night, they called and go, you got to be back Monday morning. I'm like, are you yeah. fucking kidding me? <laughs> so I tell her, and she is pissed because we're in Chicago. And it's, Chicago's great, and the food, and we're just hanging out and just having a great time. And she was so mad. I can't believe this. I'm never going with you on the road again. You always have to come back because you book a fucking acting gig. And so, <laughs> like, right now, I'm trying not to do as much stand-up, but I also just got my my own show with these two other guys in Vegas that were kind of it's still more of a works in progress, but it's in Vegas called the Guidos of Comedy. It's just three Italians, and then we sing, and, and we uh, do, like, a rap pack at the end. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's, a good it's a good time. But I'm just, you know, it, it's it's tough. Like, my manager's like, she's like, you know, she goes, I'd rather you be there just Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But now they're saying they might want us there Wednesday through Sunday. And I don't know if I can do Wednesday through Sunday. You know, because I, I, you know, I built what I built out here in L.A. for nine years. Mm-hmm. I didn't want Vegas until my 50s. And now I might have Vegas, you know. You know, and that's what you do. You make your choices, you know, but, you know. So let me ask you, take take a guy like myself or any average Joe out there who thinks he wants to be a comedian and has a podcast and, you know, I have a full-time job and, you know, what's the first step you take, you know? So as I said, I I have the podcast I do every week. I talk to, you know, great comedians like yourself and all sorts of great people. I'm, I'm a halfway crappy comic you know I, I got 10 or 15 minutes worth of material what's mm-hmm. the what's the first step that somebody's got to really consider taking to go full bore into let's say entertainment slash comedy what, what, what's your recommendations for him as my good friend rich voss says kill yourself <laughs> <laughs> you will make the news Dude, Richie, you know, you know Rich Voss? We used to be on the road, and these comics would come up to, you know, these wannabe comics, and they go, oh, my God, I write jokes. I want to try to do this. And he goes, oh, yeah, you want to be a comic? Kill yourself. Like, he, <laughs> every single time, would say, kill yourself. No, um, it's really hard now. It's, it's, it's a different world. Mm. There's the bringer world. You know the bringer world? Oh, yeah. Have you Absolutely. heard of it? Absolutely. It, it might be the worst fucking thing that's ever happened to comedy. Mm. It's ruined it. You know, you talk about the deleting and blocking. I constantly delete and block because I got these bringers hitting me up constantly or they're posting all their shows and they're the worst ever. And then there's shows out here that these comics call me and book me and they're like, hey, man, can you do my show? I'm like, I can't sit through 15 of the worst comics I've ever seen in my life to headline. (laughs) I don't give a shit if you give me 500 bucks to do a spot. You know, like I, I can't do it. You know, so that's like, it, but here's the thing. I'm not, look, I'm not saying I was always great. I'm just saying it's not fair. Like you used to have to earn your stripes and now there's no stripes to earn. Mm. There's, there's comics, there's Twitterers, there's famous Twitter guys that I see do comedy. And I'm like, what the fuck? Really? I'm like, you guys are selling out the improvs and you're not, you're, you're okay. You're, mm-hmm. you're. It's not that you're not funny at all. Mm-hmm. You're okay. It used to be you had to earn your stripes. You had to you had to do a guest set. Mm-hmm. You had to then MC. Then you had to learn how to feature, and then maybe co-headline or then headline. Now these guys come right out of uh, you know they get six or seven good minutes and they'll do a Comedy Central or something like that, and then boom. They get to go headline. Like, the, you know, everyone loves their six or seven minutes, but guess what? They can't even do 20 minutes. Hmm. You it, know? Took, so it took it, me a long time to, to even feel comfortable to say I have 15. I mean, I'm I'm a little over two and a half years into doing comedy, and, you know, I don't do it anywhere as much as I should, and I don't work at it as hard as I should. 
and and I could say I probably am comfortable doing fifteen, and you know it would just depend on you know maybe a little crowd work. But I mean, for me, I think that's awesome to be able to be in front of whether it's fifty people, twenty people, or four hundred people for fifteen minutes or five minutes. It's it's a rush. Oh no! Well, yeah, that's I mean that's the whole thing. I learned when I learned how to do stand up. The owner was like, "Look, you do the first five or ten minutes." for your first year, and that's it. And he goes, you can write as many new jokes as you want, but you don't fucking try them until you got that five or ten minutes polished. Mm -hmm. And I watch kids at these comedy store and everything out here in L.A., and I'll see them do one set, and they'll kill, and then I'll see another set, and they'll do all fucking new material, then the next time they'll do And I'm like, what are you doing? I'm like, you don't even care about the art. The art of comedy is not... Uh, let me do a great set and let me bomb and bomb until I can get this other material. The art of comedy is like, do do uh, do your great material and mix it in with a couple new bits. What with me, almost every time I go on stage, I'm gonna try one or two new things, every time. You know, and uh, right. what did Colin say? George Colin said, I think you can really only write 15 great minutes a year. But these guys are just always trying these new bits. And, and, and I also take it to the point of, you know, not to be a dick, but I, I really respect my, my career and, and the choice I've made in life. If you can't make a living at it, you can't, you know what I mean? You're not, you know, if, if you can, because so many people are scared, oh, well, I got kids or I got to have benefits or I got to, what do you think I didn't? go through that when I was a degenerate gambler and I quit a $70,000 a year dealing craps job to just do it full time, we take a chance, yeah. you know, but if you don't, then you'll never know, you know? So, so if you have the talent and you're working, work hard, write every day, get a partner. Like my best friend just moved out here for a couple months and hopefully he stays but he's from New York, and he started with Kevin James, and he's been doing comedy 20 years. But, you know, he hasn't made it. He doesn't really have many TV credits, but he's an amazing stand-up comedian, and he's, and he's a headliner, but he doesn't have any um, really TV credits at all. But every day out here, my wife's like, she goes, I can't believe you stay out till 3, 4 in the morning every night. Now, in New York, I stayed out till 3, 4, 5 in the morning every night with, like, Patrice O'Neal and stuff like that yes. back in the day. <laughs> but now... I never do that. In L.A., everybody just goes home. But but now I got my buddy from New York here, and we're out every night. And I've been writing and writing material, and it's just been amazing. Mm -hmm. And I miss that camaraderie. And you know Patrice O'Neill, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Huh? Oh, Abs yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so Patrice was a you know, big, big mentor to me. And, I mean, I was, I was a headliner, and he'd still call me an open micer. Like, he'd always... <laughs> I mean, he loved me, but he would still keep me down. Like he would, he would be like, "Yeah, you're an open micer." Like and he was, and I was the headlight. I was headlighted everywhere. But that was just his way of, you know, if he acknowledged you or he looked at you, that meant he liked you. Because if he didn't, because and, and he wasn't the type of guy where I could go, "Hey, this is Frank. This is." He, I give a fuck about this. Like that's how he was. <laughs> but he was. A genius. I mean, you yeah. could you'd watch him and go, "This is one of the greatest comedians I'm ever going to see in my life," mm -hmm. and I'm glad to have been friends with him, and glad to have had him break my balls and 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 to come up the ranks with him. You know? Absolutely. So that was that was a, an amazing thing, and um, that was another thing. I remember we were all sitting, me, Patrice, Norton. Norton probably wouldn't remember. I, I mean, I know Norton, but not like you knew Patrice. Mm -hmm. but it was me, Patrice, Norton, uh, Bobby Kelly, nice. uh, I think Ben Bailey, and Artie, Artie Fuqua, and maybe Godfrey. And we were sitting there, and um, we were going over everybody's acts. And we're going, who's a hack? And they're talking about every comic <laughs> in awesome. New York. Like, this guy's a hack, and this guy's a... And we're going through the whole thing. And Patrice had said to me, and... Uh, Patrice used to always say this to me. And he goes, you know, he goes, I don't know if you're a hack, because he goes, I don't pay attention to your act. Like he said <laughs> that to me. Right? He goes, but one thing about you, Jimmy, is he goes, you're the most famous nobody 
everybody knows. <laughs> That's awesome. He goes, everybody knows you, and you're nothing. He would say that to me. <laughs> like, and, and it wasn't like, it, and it was. And he was talking about people in the business that yeah. knew me. It wasn't like, you know, all the fans knew me. But it was right. just. <laughs> But it was great, you know, and, and and I really remember, and he, he was a very, very big impact on me. But he would tell me about, like, there were so many things he'd say. He'd go, I mean, he would say, look, don't wear a jacket on stage. Don't wear a leather jacket. You look like an idiot. Like, he, was like, he goes, you're too tight. You, you got to loosen your body when you're up there. You got to feel comfortable. But when he got all his money, I think he had 200 leather jackets <laughs> when he died. I remember, I remember he had something... And what was it? I think, I know he did a joke, something about who would you uh, rescue from a burning building, your mother or your leather jacket? <laughs> <laughs> and he picked his leather jacket. <laughs> he just, he had to love him. Absolutely. So, you know, yeah. I came up really hard with him, you know, really pushing me. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about uh, your podcast that you got going on. Well, my podcast is the Brooklyn Buddha, brooklynbuddha.com. And you go to my website, funnyjimmy.com. It's going to be on iTunes. I haven't uh, switched it over. I've been so busy. I called my web guy. He's going to switch it over to iTunes and Stitcher and all that shit. Cool. Maybe maybe I'll even talk to you about it because I'm not 100% sure, but he said he can do it. Yeah, but, it's um, pretty simple. If I if I yeah. can get on Stitcher and I and I've even made it into the top hundred comedy shows once or, or for two weeks in a row on Stitcher, now I've dropped out of existence again. But I, I got in the top hundred. I started tweeting Joe Rogan. I'm like, I'm coming after you, Joe. And he's like, he don't even respond to me. Nothing. I'm like, fuck. I'm trying to make my bones oh, yeah. off of other people's backs. I'm threatening. I'm coming for you. I'm nothing. I'm still here. Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, um. <laughs> But, but yeah, so the podcast is, my goal is, and it's kind of fucked up because there's like people coming up to me and going, man, I want to do your podcast. I heard about, I've only did two, two, two of them so far, Mm -hmm. but what it is, is this is just the way I'm going to do it. Like you didn't know me, but I did your show and, and, and no offense to anybody, but if you don't know me, you won't be able to do my show. Like, that's how I'm going to do it because I want to have that connection. You know what I mean? Right. I want to have that, like, I want to be like, yeah, Frank, so, you know, you know, David, David Frank. Or, right. is, is nickname Frank, is that how you do it? Uh, no? uh, they call me <laughs> Fat David. They call me David. They call me Frank, asshole, jerk, whatever. As long as yeah. you're talking to me, I'm responding. I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, good. exactly. Look, jerk off. So this is the way it works, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's like if I can um, have you on – Cause now I kind of, you know, I've talked with you now. So it's like, you might be someone to interview because then we could tell some good stories and stuff. But if I've never talked to you, I've never met you and, and I've never conversed and, and, and to a point of understanding something, I can't, I don't want you on because I have it like, like I just interviewed this director that I did a movie with Eddie Velez and uh, me and Eddie became really close. And I was like my big brother and Eddie was in the A team, the old A team. He was Frankie Santana and he was in traffic and he's in uh, white chicks. I mean, he's the third lead in white chicks and, and me and him are really close. So Eddie's going to be my next guest. And I mean, he's, so we're going to be able to talk about everything and he rescues cats and dogs and, (laughs) He has a cabin in the woods in Mexico now in New Mexico. And it's like, but if I don't know you, then I can't go, oh, hey, remember that time we were, we did that? Oh, remember we got the cannoli? At the, you know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. And I've had that it's, multiple times. I get people all. Yeah, he's you know, had cannolis multiple times. Oh, actually, <laughs> absolutely. But I've had many people say, you know, I don't know you to come on your show. You may have had. You know, because my, my pitch is just like I did with you and everybody else. This is my show. These are some of the people. You know, we, we have a lot of young comedians that listen. Do you want to come on? And for me, it, it's like a it's a comedy lesson every week. I learn something new. So mm-hmm. it, it's it's great for me. But I've had people like, they, they, they say to me, we don't do podcasts. And I'm like, but I just heard you on that guy's podcast. Well, I don't do podcasts to people that I don't know or shows that I don't know. So mm-hmm. there's been people mm-hmm. that I've gotten to. You know, at least I get to speak to some of these celebrities on the phone to get rejected. 
You know, I'm like, well, at least they called me to tell me fuck off. You know, that that was exactly. nice. The, the 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 fastest the fastest uh, rejection I ever got was from Bill Cosby's people. Uh, I emailed Bill Cosby's manager. I got up to take a piss, and when I came back, there was a rejection letter. Sorry, but Bill Cosby wants to have nothing to do with you, Mr. Frank. You've been on air for about four seconds, and uh, mm. sorry about your damn luck. That's hilarious. That, that you know, it, it, it's amazing to me. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this up is because there was a film out here they were doing. So my manager and agent usually always get all my work, but there's a thing called Actors Access. So I went through it on myself, and I submitted. And I said, hey, man, I said, I have a couple of weeks open um, for your date. I'd be interested in uh, meeting with the producers and directors of this film. So I get an email back, hey, can you meet at 8.30 tomorrow night, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, 8.30? What the fuck? That's kind of late. So, you know, I start, little red flags start coming up. And uh, then we go through this process of, like, going back and forth with emails for, like, one day and, Okay, you know what? Hey, we could do twelve thirty tomorrow, and this and that, and da da. And then, I, I said, well, look, you still haven't sent me the scriptures, and the girl's like, oh, it keeps bouncing back. I don't know what's up. Blah 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 blah. And then, she sends it, and I'm like, so it's five pages, and I'm like, what? And she's like, oh, it's not a script. It's just a scene. I said, yeah, I'm not gonna fucking audition for a scene. Are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> you know what I mean? You're gonna film a scene. You know that's all you're doing. It's not even a movie. It's nothing. You just represented it like it was a feature film. You said it was paid. It was this, this, this. So I turned it down. And she was like, and I, and I was really nice. And I didn't say like, I'm not gonna fucking like. I said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. My manager wouldn't let me do something like this. Thank you though. I appreciate you know the offer to come in and meet. But I'm um, good luck with your film. And a day later. And she emails back, oh, thank you, no problem, sorry, you know, for mis miscommunication. The next day, I get a um, call or an email. Uh, hey, I looked over your resume. This is the producer. I looked over your resume. You have a reasonably okay career, blah, blah, blah. Like, he talks all this shit to me. Uh -huh. And I'm not the guy to do that to. I'll fight you in a heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. and I literally took his name, and I called my manager. I forwarded it. And then I deleted it, and then I went on Facebook, and I got his name, and I deleted and blocked it as well because I was like, holy shit. Because if I get this guy, and he was like an Indian guy, like, you know, dot and head Indian, <laughs> you know, blah, 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 right? Yeah. And I'm like, if this guy, if I see him, I'll beat the fuck out of him. So I called a big casting director friend of mine, and he was like, oh, no. He goes, dude, you got to report him. He goes, you, you cannot... He's like, you cannot do that. You, you, he, he, he goes, you cannot talk to an actor like that. And I was like, you know, dude, I go, I'm ready to fucking kill this guy. So then, sure enough, um, I deleted, blocked it. My manager sent me an email back like an hour later. She goes, she goes, you know what? We thought about it. Just let it go. Just he, this person's gonna ruin their ruin themselves in Hollywood anyways. You know what I mean? Like, not Absolutely, that they ever had yeah. a chance. But so the thing is, for that guy, it makes me so mad for those Bill Cosby people to have said what they said to you. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, you're only on the air four seconds. Well, no, no, no. I, I exaggerated not. that. I, I exaggerated that. I was. Oh, they literally okay. just sent me, you know, thanks, but we're not interested. I made it sound more evil, but you can go ahead and bash oh, okay. me. <laughs> I don't want to really. If, if somebody's ever listening and I ever have another shot, I'm sure he's a nice guy. But they, they sent me a nice letter. But I am just a wannabe hack, and he not worthy of Bill Cosby. No, but you Bill, know what? It doesn't Bill matter. Cosby. And listen, and, and I'll tell you right now, it's good to have that controversy. If it starts getting around, then Bill Cosby's people, and then he'll call, and then next, next, who knows, maybe you end up having an interview. He's like, like I didn't know they did that, and he might be mad. We, mm -hmm. we, we get mad at our representation. Our representation sometimes have the egos. I yelled at Andrew Dice's Clay's manager once. I, I called up, and I, and I spoke to him on the phone, and he's like, your internet radio? And he goes, Andrew Dice Clay doesn't know anything about internet. He won't do anything. I'm like, so just tell him it's a fucking radio show. You don't have to know. It's live. We could be able to call right. in whatever mm -hmm. we want. 
And he's like, well, I'm like, what the fuck, man? Come on. I had Martin Short on last week. This person called in. Let's do it. Don't even tell him. He's a nobody. I'm like, well, I'm going off. And I'm like, wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't be yelling at you like this. Who else do you represent? <laughs> and he's like, click. <laughs> oh, well, so it wasn't, you, it wasn't uh, Parisi. Was it Wheels Parisi? Uh, I, I have to look up on my notebook at home. Oh. And see if I could read through his name. But um, I have a whole list of people that I've, you know, I don't bring the notebook with me here, but no, I, I've gotten I'm, a lot better at getting people on the show. You, and, you, uh, don't, you don't bring the notebook while you sit on the toilet and do the podcast. I know. I do the same. <laughs> I'm afraid the to wipe with it. The Buddha taking a shit podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, yeah. Shh, do you hold hear on. that, folks? Do you, do you hear the flush? <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of vegetables today, so it could be gassy. Oh, there you go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so this is a pretty good etiquette out in uh, L.A. as far as actors are concerned with other people. Uh, I, something like that story happening like that, that doesn't happen, obviously, oh. unless you, you want to bury your career out there or something like that. Apparently. Of what story? Well, what with, the, with the, the with gentleman the... Who, who messed with you, the Indian guy who, who messed with you and sent you that oh, yeah. letter back. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. shame on him. Yeah. First off, you don't know who you're talking to, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, I'll come with that New York attitude out here mm-hmm. every once in a while. I don't always bring it out because I've gotten pulled a gun on me twice in L.A. Damn. Like in New York, my whole life, never a gun. It's like in L.A., bam, gun. Wow. Gun at the drama, Samuel French drama bookstore in the alley. Wow. I mean, it's, it's like, Yeah. So you just look at them here in LA. Got shit to prove. Yeah, you look at them the wrong way. They want to pop a cap in your ass. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I've talked. Like I actually tried to. I considered moving with my with my job out to LA so I could try to do comedy out there and all that. And everybody's like, "Man, you get shot out there." I'm like, "Oh, I grew up in New York. It's not a big deal." They're like, "Nah, man, you got to be careful where you live. You got to know the right color to wear, where you can be." They're like, you could just be walking down the street in a blue shirt and get shot because you're just a white guy in the wrong spot in blue. And I'm like, Yeah, well. no, it's definitely, it's definitely, I, LA, I love L.A. I mean, I have no problem. There's great food. It's great. You know, I have good people here. But, uh, yeah, a couple blocks away from me are like the gangs. And I live in a real nice neighborhood, but mm-hmm. it doesn't matter because then a couple blocks up, they just have gangs. Right. I think I was looking yeah. at, uh, it was it uh, East L.A.? East, yeah, well, East L.A. is that, you know, that's, yeah, that's tough. That's a tough area. Yeah, and then there was, uh, there was a predominantly gay area that had some positions opening as well. <laughs> I didn't get any yeah. of the... I didn't get any of the yeah. jobs, and I was like, whatever, man. They could fix up my hair and make me dress better. I, I don't care. Just get me out there. At the time, that was my thought anyway. Right, exactly. I got something to learn from them. So, what else is there, you know, what do you want the people to know about you, aside from the Italian tough guy that I think they've formed and known to love? Well, on the I mean, you know, look, I'm the mobster with the heart. You know, that's what they always say. You know, my macho vulnerability, I can't even say it, my macho vulnerability is what books me the acting roles. Because they're like, oh my God, he's, you know, he's he looks so tough, but... That he's got this heart of gold, you know. All right. That's that's something, you know. Something that's really good. Like uh, Eddie Bro from David Letterman taught me. Uh, you know, he's the booker for David Letterman forever, and uh, he taught me. He's like, look, smile on stage. He goes, because you look like a bad ass on stage. He goes, if you smile, you get away with anything. He goes, you can say the c word. <laughs> It is true. I actually have a joke about the C word. I said my dad used to get mad. I would swear in front of my mother. He goes, "What do you do? You don't swear in front of your in front of your mother. It's disrespectful to me and your mother." And I go, "Dad, what do you swear all the time." You go, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! It doesn't matter what I do. I want you to say you don't swear in front of your mother because she's not one of your cunt girlfriends that you <laughs> bang in the alley." <laughs> he said to me. She's not one of your cunt girlfriends. I'm like, you just said cunt in front of Baja. <laughs> no meatballs for you. Yeah. So, yeah. I was yeah, my, watch- mom's, my mom's Asian. What, Asian. What, what kind of impression was that? <laughs> 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 
So I wanted see, to ask. That's the thing. You hear that, Gwiggy? See how I listen? Yeah. That's improv. Improv <laughs> is listening and reacting. Absolutely, brother. Really. I'm with you. Yeah. I watched one of the commercials that I believe you also uh, directed a little bit and wrote. Was a Doritos commercial? Oh, my Doritos, yeah. Excellent. I mean, I thought I don't know if you gotten the chance to see it yet, Quiggy. But one, no. uh, what was it like? Was that the first time that you had, a, you know, the directing role, or what was your role in that? Aside, you know, from being in it. Well, I produced it and directed it with Eddie Velez. Actually, um, what happened was I had jury duty, and this guy calls me um, the week before, and he goes, "Hey, I'm doing the Doritos commercial. I want to put you in it." So I did it. And it sucked. And I was like, ugh, I got to write my own. So I was, like, annoyed that I had even did it. So then I went, it was a jury duty, and I ended up writing my own commercial. And uh, we shot it the next week. Literally, I shot that. I wrote it Monday, flushed it out Thursday. We shot it Sunday in one day. And it really got a lot of response. Doritos... Uh, contacted me and said we really love it they said it's they go it's too violent but it's really funny and i had more <laughs> lines in it but i actually cut it because it had to be 30 seconds right yeah cool cool so listen cool. we uh i want to thank you we're, we're going to wrap it up a little bit and we always wrap it up i like to give everybody the opportunity to talk about you know what they have coming up so do you have some shows coming up and uh where are you going to be at where people can find you well, the best best bet is you can always uh, Facebook me. So you, but the best bet to get me there is just go to Brooklyn Buddha. That's Brooklyn. That B U D D H A dot com or Funny Jimmy J I M M Y dot com, Funny Jimmy dot com, and then you can just add me on Facebook. And you can always just message me. Uh, you know, even if you don't know me, and hit me up and go, Hey, I'm a fan. I want to come see a show or some shit like that. But you can also go to funnyjimmy.com and check my dates. I don't always put all my dates there. My, my out-of-town dates, but my in-town dates usually can just hit me up and say, hey, are you performing anywhere in L.A.? Right. You know, like if, if you come out from Florida or whoever's listening and, you know, they're coming from Texas and they're like, oh, they're going to be there. You know, like the other day I was headlining uh, the El Paso Comic Strip, which is a great club, and uh, I had like 30 people from uh, L.A. fly out to the gig. Nice. So it was amazing. I was like, and they were like, yeah, we just brought tickets. So I'm like, wow, why the fuck would you go all the way out there? You know what? <laughs> they do. Well, I think it's a com. I mean, you always say, I have a lot of people that are on Facebook friends, comedians and some actors, and there seems mm -hmm. to be a lot of jet flying back and forth between Vegas and L.A. I mean, that's like the popular thing to do. Well, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I perform in Vegas a lot. Like I said, I have that Guido show. You can go to VegasGuidos.com. You can check that out. I'm on that website. And we have our show. But like I said, it's still works in progress. And uh, that's uh, Bakker's produces that show. Mm -hmm. So we're doing that show. But, um, you know, I just, you know, it's like right now it's pilot season, so I kind of need to be in Los Angeles to make sure that I get all these uh, good auditions and, you know, hopefully, you know, book a – book a new pilot I, I did like eight pilots in the last uh two years so you know it's like one of these will pop you know like billy gardell probably got mike and molly and that's it he so, writes his own thing here's a question for you when you're doing uh when when it's this time in la and you're doing pilots are you guys getting paid to do the pilots because this is a whole world that i know nothing about or we oh, doing yeah, pilots? Yeah, yeah. No, you get paid a lot of money to do a pilot. There's different quotes. You know, it can be anywhere from, you know, this thing called Favored Nations where you might all just make five or 10000 each to do the pilot, mm. or you might get thirty or forty grand or 100 grand. I mean, I, I'm not making 100 grand <laughs> for a pilot yet, but you do, you know. Cool. That is great. Yeah. Well, Gwiggy, did you have any other questions at all? Um, no, that was it was everything I had so far. Yeah, that was everything yeah, you had. That was from what I can think of, where, where we're at right now. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, just, listen, you don't know I'm him just, well enough. You can't go on his podcast, sorry. but <laughs> you can talk to him on Facebook. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Who, Gwiggy, Squiggy, who's yeah. this guy? Gwiggy, <laughs> Gwiggy with it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much that's where I got the name from. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, listen, cool. Jimmy, I want to thank you very much for spending some time with us. 
Uh, it was very entertaining. I think we learned a little bit. I guess I'm going to keep my ass in Florida for a little while because I, I, I ain't anywhere near ready for going in anything in Hollywood. Well, who knows? When I come out to Florida, maybe, maybe we can put together a show out there. I could come out and do a theater or something, and we could do a thing, and you can open for me. There you go. Right. Let me know All when right. you're coming out. I, I got a couple of different places we can book people with. Oh, good. We'll talk about it. I got your info. We'll Absolutely. You Listen, cool. thank you again very much. Uh, I'll send you out a copy of the show if you want to share it with the world so I get more popular off a year back. That would be great. If you have okay, any, perfect. you know, if real quick, one other thing I like to have people do, give a shout out to maybe some of your uh, favorite up-and-coming comedians. Anybody out there that you want people to look for, try to find online that you think are putting in a good work ethic and have a good chance out there? Yeah, I actually, it's funny, I just, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Brando Murphy, who's Eddie Murphy's son, he's doing comedy, he's from Florida, actually, he looks okay. just like him, you know, he'd probably end up doing, he would probably do your show, in fact. It, All right. probably sounds like for, somebody I'd love to have on Eddie Murphy's son. Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's amazing, uh, I think he's going to be a big star, he's only doing it six months, so I think he's really wow. good. I just saw another uh, kid named Gerard Carmichael. I think he's the next Ch Chappelle. He's really wow. funny. I saw him at the comedy store the other night. And, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know too many other ones. Um, every once in a while, there's some diamonds in the rough. There you go. You know, but uh, hopefully, you know, they all continue and they grow and, you know, they write and they work and they, they, they figure it out. It takes years to get your voice. I mean, 21 mm -hmm. years I'm doing comedy. I feel like I probably didn't find it until my 15th, 16th year in. I feel like I faked it all my life. <laughs> and now I really know how to write a joke and really deliver it. And I don't even have to go on stage. I can pretty much just write it and do it and know it's going to work. All right. And that's, I, I can't wait till I get to that point. Steve Eric is like that. Yeah. Uh, Steve yeah. Eric is a local guy. He's been around forever. Uh, 25, 30 years in comedy, and we go to writing sessions when football and racing season aren't in on Sundays, and that's exactly what he says. He's like, you know, I don't necessarily go out to open mics because if I, I'll just try a new joke on, you know, why he's on stage, and if it does good, he'll add two or three more lines to it and just improve exactly. it. Yeah. So exactly. So it, it takes a little bit of work to get there. But again, thank you. Spread the word. Mm -hmm. Fat Davey yeah. and the Let's Be Frank <laughs> show is taking over the world, and we're going to do it with you, man. Cool. Thanks so much, man. FunnyJimmy.com, right. Brooklyn Buddha. Thanks. All right. Thank Have you. a great night. Later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was pretty cool. That was cool. very cool, yeah. Definitely. That, 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 that puts a lot of stuff into perspective. I mean, just finding out a little bit of a pilot season and then just the way, you know, etiquette works out with acting out there. I mean, that that that's pretty. That was a pretty cool conversation with him. I mean, I mean, he took over the whole show, but it was great just – taking everything in here i mean that was awesome so it, it, you it's, know it's funny you say he took over the whole show i was just talking with john j murray yeah. uh two two thursdays ago mm -hmm. at uh the open mic at jack's mm -hmm. and he's got a great podcast something planet, planet that's been on for years and it's a totally different show than mine mm -hmm. and, and he, and he kind of paid me a compliment and he's like you know yeah i'm because i'm like you know i, I want to kind of do a little bit more where we get crazy with people and he's like you can't do that because he goes, you're getting good at interviewing people. And I'm like, yeah, the better I get at interviewing people, the more I'm not talking. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and he's that, like, exactly. That's great. You know, we it's didn't perfect. ever say anything. You, you <laughs> just had great stories. It was awesome. So, And everything. So that, that, was, that was pretty impressive. That was awesome. So, All right. I, well, I'm, we, always, I'm always fascinated by the people that we, that we learn about here on this show. Just with, with, I mean, this guy's had a huge career so far. And, and, and probably like, you know. Most people don't know who he is necessarily, but in, in a lot of cases, we've probably seen him places. Exactly. And, and that's awesome that he's got to work with people like Patrice O'Neill and uh, Rick Voss, all these other people that he's talked about. You know, just that's awesome. So, that's, yeah. I mean, once you, when you yeah. see his face, you're like, I, I, I've seen him in movies. Yeah. And I mean, he's been in Verizon commercials, mm -hmm. and all, all these different things. And you're like, oh, shit, yeah. I remember seeing that. And mm -hmm. if you go to his bio and you look at the whole yeah. list, it's like a, it, there's more there than I want to read in yeah. a week. <laughs> but you can see he's definitely put the work in for stuff like that. I mean, that's just, you know, at, at, you can see why he's so just on the ball with acting, comedy, and everything, and he's just all over the place because he's put the work in to do that. And it's just, you know, absolutely. Awesome. And it all starts with hooking up with somebody with a limo so you can get <laughs> yeah. whores on the street 
and then you get famous. So yeah. go out there, get a <laughs> limo, some get some answer. hookers, and get famous. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. We'll see you next week. We got some great shows coming up, and we'll speak to you then. Oh, wait, we got to wave bye bye to the. We've come to the end of another edition of the Let's Be Frank show. To catch up on past shows, find us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Podomatic at Let's Be Frank's Podcasts. Want to be part of the show? Email Dave at Let's Be Frank with Dave Frank at Yahoo.com. Stay funny, my friends. See you next week. <laughs>